you don't want to miss this. So everyone, grab a seat, and I am super excited to introduce to you guys Chad Ashley from Grayscale Gorilla. Woo! Yay. I, I'm the short guy. I'm going to struggle to uh, get seen back here. I might need a stool. Or you can just move up. Anybody wants to order me a shot? Now would be the time. Uh, any, any, any bourbon would be good. How you guys doing? Really? That's all you got? You're spent? Let's hear it. Come on. DFW. DFW. I'm from Chicago, so this is, this is a, yeah, there we go. Go Bears. Go Bears. Will I get shot if I say go Bears right now? I hope not. That would suck. Anyway, so uh, my name is Chad. If we could go to the slides so people could just see another image of me wearing these pants. That would be fantastic. All right, so who the hell is this guy? Well, I'm Chad. I'm a creative director at Grayscale Grill. You may know me or uh, one of the other fine-looking gentlemen that work at Grayscale Gorilla. This is uh, a, a weekend getaway that we just went to not too long ago. And I snapped this picture. I'm like, this is fantastic. These guys are great. Very happy to be a part of this Grayscale Gorilla family. Uh, Mike is actually here. Mike is, uh, check this out. I brought this cool little device. So I'm going to be able to do cool laser pointer thingies all night. Uh, so watch out. Watch your eyeballs. So this is Mike. Mike, where are you at? There he is. Mike's our marketing director. He lives in the area, local, to uh, the DFW area. Is that the same county, right, Mike? No? Okay, I don't know what I'm talking about. Don't listen to me. What the hell am I doing here? Why the hell did I fly all the way to DF, DFW land? I don't know. Because I'm going to talk about this epic project that I just wrapped up. Uh, I've been, I spent a year on this project. I don't know if you've ever spent that long on a project, but I can tell you it'll test your limits of, uh, of beer consumption, caffeine consumption, and just overall just well-being. I created 350 materials that were just put out into a package for Grayscale Gorilla. How many people here use Cinema 4D? Quite a few, right? All right, great. Awesome. So uh, these materials are actually... Uh, you can use them in Octane. Any, I know we had a few Octane people here. I saw some hands go up. There we go. Redshift? Yeah, a few. And Arnold? Yes, okay. We've got a few people from all the demos. This is great. So 350 materials, you can use them in Octane, Redshift, and Arnold. And I've been spending a lot of my time this year working on these. This journey started all the way in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah, there we go. Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So why, why would I go searching for textures in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Because Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a, is a fantastic town, number one. I love it. It's a great town. I lived there for a few years. But what you need to know about Milwaukee is that after about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a weekend, it is like a ghost town. It's like zombie apocalypse ghost town. So it's actually the most perfect place to go searching for textures of things, to shoot photos, and just mostly just hang out with your friends and shoot some crazy pictures. So this is my buddy, Tim. I told Tim, I'm like, you know, I want to go. He lives in Milwaukee, works at an ad agency in Milwaukee. And I said, listen, I think Milwaukee would be a perfect place to go with my camera and shoot a bunch of cool city textures for this material pack I want to do. He's like, I got you. I got a minivan. I want to get away from my kids. Thank you very much. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Whoa, it's going to be a different show now. Anyway, Tim's like, I got you, man. Just come to my house. I'm going to set you up. We're going to do this in style. So Tim doesn't do anything half-assed. And if you've been to Half Res, Tim is actually the guy who creates all the Half Res skateboards that we put out for uh, the Half Res event. So he doesn't do anything half-assed. So when I told him that I was like, you know, I want to go on this texture hunt, you know, go try to find some textures, he's, I show up at his house, and he, he has printed out maps. So I don't know if you can see this right here. I'm going to use my laser pointer now. So he printed out maps with all the sites that he thought I'd be able to get good textures, brick textures, concrete textures. And these texture, good textures are hard to find. They're hard to shoot. They're hard to make. They're hard to, to create materials from. 
So first thing I did is, you know, I got there to this Collectivo, which is a fantastic coffee shop uh, in Milwaukee. If you haven't been there, go check it out. And I'm like, man, you've really out, you've outdone yourself. I don't know what, I don't know what to make of this. He's like, I'm going to take you all around. You're going to shoot all the textures you need. So I was super stoked. I was like, oh, this is going to be a, f a fun time with my friend. I'm going to shoot a bunch of textures. And we had a blast. We went all over Milwaukee shooting textures of brick and concrete and dirt and like all the things that I was going to bring back to my house and create materials from. So let me tell you a little bit about the gear that I brought. So when I decided I wanted to make these textures, I needed a camera that could shoot really high resolution pictures. So I found out at the time, I'm, I'm sure there's probably, I'm not a camera person, I'm going to admit that publicly right now, but I knew that the Sony a7R II was a 42.4 megapixel camera. It could shoot about 7,952 by 5304, which is a really big image, right? That's actually perfect for me because I wanted to do a 4K by 4K texture map size, which is like 4096 by 4096. So I knew this camera was going to work awesome. I got a 55 millimeter prime lens so that I could eliminate as much of the barrel distortion as possible and get really nice, flat, clean images. I also brought a Macbeth chart. Who here knows what a Macbeth chart is? One, two, no, three. Oh, three. We got one back there. So have you ever, have you ever seen like a, like a behind the scenes thing where somebody's like taking reference and they've got a little card with a bunch of different colored boxes on them? That's called a Macbeth chart. And what that does is it allows me to calibrate the color and light information in the room and white balance my picture so that if I'm taking a picture outside and it's really overcast, I can correct for that blue tint that the picture might have. And if I'm indoors, I can correct for the, the orange tint. So it's really handy. Also, you need a minivan, as I found out later. Um, it helps to hold all the snacks and, uh, and also all of the Collectivo coffee. You also need a, uh, a flatbed scanner because a lot of times, you know, shooting photos and going out and shooting textures to bring back into 3D is great, but sometimes a flatbed scanner is really all you need because something that you want to capture is like the size of this bucket, and you don't really need to shoot a photo of that. You can just throw it onto a flatbed scanner, scan it in, you're, you're good to go. The other thing that you need, and I'm going to tell, I tell this to everybody I meet, it's one of my favorite tools ever. It's called Pure Ref. I'm going to show it to you later, but right now, I'm, I'm just going to plant that little seed in your brain, and then you're going to remember it later, and hopefully you download it, because it's super awesome. Anyway, so I went on a huge texture safari with Chris. Or sorry, uh, yeah, I think it was Tim and Chris. And then I came back home with gigs and gigs of pictures, like so many pictures. And I needed to sort through them all and sort of figure out which ones I wanted to use and create all these different materials from. But I knew that photos weren't going to be enough. And how many people have here have tried to like just do everything with a photo and you end up like, you can only push it so far in Photoshop. You can't just, you can't make a brick wall look like a brick wall unless you find the absolute perfect brick wall and then hope that it'll tile okay, but it's not going to tile perfect because it wasn't the right brick. So I knew I wanted to augment all the photos I took with actual procedural-based materials. Now, what does that mean? It means I had to learn a tool called Substance Designer. How many people here have heard of Substance Designer? Wow. All right. Sub wow. Substance got more hands than I think the renderers did. This is going to be a great demo. Um, so... I, I knew, I'm like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to shoot textures, but I need to do, I want to make my own because that's just, the photos aren't going to be enough. I'm going to need to learn something else. So I, th I looked around and I tried Quixel, which is like this other one that comes in Photoshop, and it's kind of weird. It's not really easy to understand. But what I loved about Substance is that it was easy to learn. Well, relatively, I, I did give myself a pretty long timeline to learn it. But here, I'll just go through the reasons. Number one, I knew that if I could just author all of my materials, even bringing in the photos that I shot and mixing them with stuff I would create from scratch, I could do it all in Substance Designer. And then I knew that if I could supplement all that stuff with si Substance Procedurals, and a fa if you don't know what a procedural is, it's just a fancy way of saying you're creating something from scratch. Like you're not starting with a picture, you're creating a brick wall from scratch using the tools inside of Substance Designer. 
So I also knew that I was going to have photos, and they're going to be 4K and tileable. So I needed to have a, a feature set that would allow me to make a tileable texture really easily. I needed to have a deep feature set. It also needed to have a quick learning curve because I needed to start cranking on these. As soon as I finished shooting these textures, I wanted to be back in my house cranking out materials and making awesome stuff. But the big reason is because I wanted a PBR workflow. So PBR, besides a fantastic beverage, actually stands for uh, physically based rendering. Now, that's a really weird term, and you may have heard that thrown around a little bit, but it's kind of weird and, and almost kind of like, it doesn't make a lot of sense even to me. So I'm going to try my best to define it for you guys right now. So PBR workflow, basically, if you read this, let's just read it together. Physically based rendering, PBR, is a methodology rather than a hard standard. There are specific principles and rules and guidelines, but no one true rule, which means there, are, there can be different implementations. The map types and workflow can vary. Ultimately, what this means is that if you're used to creating materials in any 3D program, you know that you have like a diffuse map and you have a specular map and you might have like a, a roughness map and a normal map. But if you want to create complex metals, let's say like a rusted metal for like a game or a video, whatever the hell you're making, you don't want to have to have a rust material and a metal material and then try to blend them together because that's a lot of overhead, right? So what if I could have a metal material and a rust material, material be the same material, right? That's metalness. That's what that's called, right? So if you have a metalness map that's telling the shader, okay, over here your your copper or your or your maybe your iron, and over here your rust, you have a completely different look, a completely different reflective property, but it's all in one place. And that was like blowing my mind. I was like, oh man, that sounds perfect because I don't want to have like a ton of m of like maps, and I don't want it to be confusing for people. So this will actually be great. So I started learning substance. And immediately, I recommend everybody do this. This is the second thing I'm going to recommend tonight, besides Pure Ref, which we'll go over later. Keep a screenshot diary of something you're learning. Doesn't matter what. Could be After Effects, could be Photoshop, could be Cinema, could be whatever the hell you're learning. Take frequent screenshots and save them. Don't, you don't have to share them. They could just be for you. But it's a great way to document where you've been and where you've come and how far you've gone. And it's a great way to, like, when you're done with a project or you're done learning something, you can take a step back and say, wow, this is where I started and this is where I en ended and I feel like I've accomplished something. And that, that is a feeling that I absolutely love and I try to encourage in other people that I speak to. So make a screenshot diary. I'm using Google Photos here, but you can use whatever the hell you want. I'm just a Google nerd, so that's just what I use. Anyway, so I started learning Substance. And I'm going to go through some slides now showing you some of my work in Substance and as I learned it, the things that I kind of did right and some of the things that I did wrong. So immediately, um, I, I learned that you could bring in your own models, which is what this little shader ball here that I developed early on in the process. And this material here is like a gold foil. And when I created this gold foil, this was not based on a photo. This was actually based on a scan. I took a piece of paper, a piece of white paper from my, my, my printer, and I crumpled it up a bunch of times, like crumple it up once, empty, you know, like kind of string it out, crumple it up again until I just came up with this like really crumply paper. And then I just set it loosely on my flatbed scanner and I scanned it. And then what I did is I had Substance take that data, that picture that it makes, and it can create depth from a photo. And it automatically created this, well, with some other nodes that you can kind of see peeking in right here. It's not just a, a scan. I had to do some other trickery. but just from that alone, I was able to get a, like a, a crumply gold foil look, which was really a lot of fun. So then I started experimenting more in, in churning up like little bits of dirt and trying to find grime and textures. I ended up trying to create this like more corroded look, which sort of then led to a, a corrugated metal look. And if you've ever played around in Substance, it obviously from these photos uses nodes. So how many people here are fans of nodes? Wow, this is so great. You guys, this is making my night. Because I don't get a lot of people that raise their hand when I say, are you fans of nodes? But it is Node-vember. So let's give it up for Node-vember, and I will take a drink with that. No, Node-bender, sure. Um, anyway, so I started learning 
I started getting into uh, lots of different ways to kind of make my textures a little bit more intuitive and like figure out exactly how this program works. And so Substance is great because what it allowed me to do is uh, it allowed me to, if you see this panel down here, this is actually, this is actually a GPU renderer that ships with inside of Substance. So Substance ships with iRay. If you've ever heard of iRay, it's actually a pretty cool render. It was made by NVIDIA. And I think now, actually, it's not being developed anymore. But Substance has it built in. And that's important because otherwise, I would be using like the OpenGL workflow in Substance. And I know that m all of you are probably not going to render in OpenGL. You're going to render in like Redshift, or you're going to render in Arnold, or you're going to render in something there. So having a, a GPU renderer built into Substance was great because I could get an idea of what it was going to look like exactly when I brought it into Cinema later. So right here, you can see these are all the HDRI maps that you can load into the background of Substance. And you can see here I've got like a studio map that's one of ours. This is from our Pro Metals collection that we sell on grayscalegorilla.com. So you can bring in your own HDRIs. You can bring in your own assets. And you can sort of start to create your own materials. And I started to get really excited. And I started to get a little bit better and a little bit better until so finally I started to get to a place that I could actually create things that I was finding and reference images that I was finding and taking my photos that I shot and bringing them in and making them tileable. And it was getting like super exciting. And then I started realizing like, wow, this is actually super powerful stuff. And of course, like it looks really crazy. Like don't, this is just my messiness. It actually could have been a lot fewer nodes than this. So all of these nodes right here create this material right here. And maybe I should point over my shoulder, but my aim's not that good, so I'll do it over here. So this is actually not using any photographs. This is just using procedurals. So I'm using different map types and different procedural generators inside of Substance to create the paint bubbly little bits and creating different masks to mask off the parts that are metal and the parts that are painted. And it's a lot like compositing. So if you're familiar with compositing in After Effects or Nuke or Fusion, it's a lot of the same principles inside of Substance when you're creating materials. So then I started to get excited. I'm like, oh man, I bet I could like, I bet I wonder if I could take reference images that, that I have that I, I find inspirational and try to find an element and recreate it in substance. And I have a friend of mine that works at Man vs. Machine in Los Angeles, and he was I was showing him my progress, and he was like, oh man, we did this, we did this spot with this really great pink background, but I I want it to be made out of leather. Do you think you could try that? And I did. So this is the pink leather over here, and this is my reference. And so by using, oh, here's another funny story. To get this leather, what I did was I went to a Hobby Lobby. Do you guys have Hobby Lobby down here? All right, so I went to a Hobby Lobby, and I went to like the fabric area, and they had like a gigantic, you know, I'm, I'm not a fabric person, but they had like these reams of like fabric, and they had fake leather. And I'm like, oh man, this fake leather looks really real. So I, I, I cut off a big swatch of it, took it home, to put it on my flatbed scanner. I scanned it maybe like 10 different pieces of it. And I created a tileable leather that I use in like, I swear, like 15 materials. It's the same leather. I just reuse it again and again and again. Anyway, so again, earlier I said I was going to mention Pure Ref. So this, this little box right here, this is Pure Ref. Pure Ref is nothing more than a, an ability to put reference imagery on top of everything you're doing. So if, have you ever like had a reference image or client sends you some look or something and you have to keep constantly opening up that window to look at it and you're like, oh, I forgot what it looked like. Oh, I forgot. Forget all that mess. Go Google Pure Ref when you get home. It is fantastic, it's free, and it puts images into a canvas that sits on your desktop. It sits on top of everything on your desktop so it's always right in front of you. And when you're working, this will improve your work at least 10 to 15, maybe even 50%. I, I made a big promise, but it'll improve your work because you're immediately looking at something that you're trying to match and your work over here. And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, this highlight needs to be brighter. I get it. And then you start, you start making it better. And that is just, that's great. When I, when I found Pure F, I was like, holy crap, my materials are going to get crazy. So I got, I got better. I got a little bit better every time I started doing more and trying to, trying to achieve different looks. So this is like a corroded uh, copper or bronze, actually. And so uh, you could see this image over here on the, on the right. 
This is a grunge map. This is, these are grunge maps that I shot and created uh, during my safari. And then also I went home and just made a mess on some poster board and took a bunch of pictures of it and created my own internal library of grunge and dirt. And it was a blast to make. And it was a lot of fun. And it's been paying off dividends because I use them on everything in this pack. So this is like a, a damaged kind of like... I don't know if it's like dented or maybe some sword hit it or something. This is like another corroded sort of copper looking uh, material. But again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive this point home that reference is the key to doing work, doing good work. And I, and I, I firmly believe that, that you, you can go down a path blindly and sometimes you'll strike gold. But if you don't have good reference, then... Ah, uh, you may, you probably not, it's going to take you a lot longer to hit it. So pure ref, I'm going to show you some, some examples here of when I started to actually learn substance to the point where I could get a, a reference image and match it. So this is a brick wall picture that I found, and then I matched it in substance. And it, had I not had this reference picture up, I would have just been like blindly making brick walls without any sort of real life reference, without any, some, anything to tie it back to reality. So I started to get pretty good at it. And so this is a real picture. And this is completely procedural. There's no photos in this one here. And so over here, you can see the bump map, right? So this, actually, I believe this is my height map that I turn into a normal map. So you can see here, anything that's white is sticking up. And anything that's dark is pushing back into the wall. So this creates that subtle depth of the paint chipping away on that wall. And this is all procedural. So that, at this point, I started to get pretty comfortable. And I was like, all right, this is actually working really well. Uh, I'm going to see how far I can go. And I found this other texture of like a school brick wall. It was a photo. And I'm like, man, I wonder if I can make this cool like blue kind of black brick wall. Once you start to learn the tools and you get comfortable, I love that feeling when you, how many people here are so comfortable in a tool that you can sort of vision it in your head and then like, it just makes its way to the screen. Like That's a fantastic feeling. And it only comes from practice and learning and just pushing yourself. And that's what I started to do. I started to like, oh man, okay, I'm going to try this one. And I'm going to try, maybe I can do some rock. That'd be cool. And then I was like, you know, marble is really, is really hot material right now. A lot of people doing marble and leather. So I was like, oh, I wonder if I can do completely procedural marble. And I could, because I had a pretty gr firm grasp at this. I had been working on this for now maybe four months, and I was getting an idea of how it worked, and I just started cranking. And if you notice, my, all my, my node trees are getting a little more organized and a little bit bigger. And that's okay, because once you get the idea of it, and you understand how it works, it's not intimidating anymore. It's not, it's not a real... It doesn't break your mind to think about it because you, as you get better at it, you start to get less intimidated by the size and you start to understand how it flows and it becomes really fun. And then you start to look at other things. I'm like, oh, I wonder if I could make this countertop, like this granite countertop. Yeah, no problem. I wonder if I can make a jawbreaker. Yeah, that's not, that's not hard. Just some flecks of blue and some flecks of red and some pink. So this is the photo of the jawbreaker and this is the jawbreaker material I made. This is completely procedural. And I'm going to show you why that's cool. Oh, you know, I was redoing my kitchen at the time. <laughs> so I was looking at a lot of, like, subway tiles. So you're going to see a little bit of a thread here. So subway tile photo here, some completely procedural t tile texture here that can then be exported into Maya, Cinema, a game engine, whatever I wanted to. It was fantastic. I started looking at, oh, man, maybe this floor. This floor would be great. This would be fun to try to make. And then I just started, it started going, my brain started going crazy. And then one day I was like, man, one of my favorite movies, a very iconic scene in one of my favorite movies, I wonder if I can make this, pil this pillar of tiles and make it look like one of my favorite scenes in one of my favorite movies. And now I'm going to take a small break and, and we're going to give out a prize because if, you can an if, if anybody can yell out the name of this movie, I'm going to give you these materials for free. What is the name of this movie right here in this frame that's obscured probably a little bit by this speaker for some of you, but, well, you can see it over here. Who knows this movie? Close. You got it. No, I'm kidding. Come on. Nobody? I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. 
Logan's wrong. <laughs> That's amazing. I should give it to you for that alone. But no, it actually... Okay, so I'll give you a hint. All right. It starts... The, the name of the movie starts with an H. And it, uh, it has uh, Eric Bana. Who said Hannah was over here? All right, you just won 350 materials. 350 materials. Handcrafted in my office with my dog behind me, drinking lots of bourbon and coffee. Anyway, so I'm glad you're all still awake. Uh, all right, we got a few more slides. And I'm going to show you some fun stuff. But so I started exploring more and then I was realizing that what I was creating here was like an everyday material pack. It was like a pack of materials that I wish I had every day in production that I could just whip out and throw some throw a road on something or if you're a, a, an EDC nerd like myself, those of you that know what that is will get this joke, but a rotary mat. I don't know why I'm a nerd for EDC uh, culture and everything that you carry with you every day. I don't care what walk of life you're in, I'm fascinated by what people take with them every day on their jobs because it means something to them, it's useful to them. And that's what this material library means to me. It's an actual bunch of materials that I'm gonna use every day and I have been using every day since I started this project. So one of my favorite parts and one of my favorite sections of these materials are the concretes. I, I'm a former skateboarder so concrete has a, has a special place in my heart and I always am looking at concrete as, a, as an obstacle or a form of expression. So for me, doing concrete materials was really fun. It was, a, it was a way for me to sort of channel some of that energy. But then also I started looking at woods, and woods are really hard. I don't know if you've ever looked for like a really good wood material or a really good wood shader. They're really hard to find because they're super hard to photograph. So I figured out a way to make them procedurally. So you can see here, all of these nodes and noises and bits and pieces of materials mixed together are forming wood. And this is my reference using PureRef. And this is all done in substance. There's no images in this texture. And then I started to get further. I'm like, maybe I can make floors. OK, well, now I'm going to make floors with displacement so that each board sort of like bends up in a different way. And that's what this wacky map down here looks like. So this is a height map for all the different floorboards, kind of like maybe tilting in odd ways. And then I like, oh man, maybe I could do grass. And then I started thinking about, well, let me do grass. Maybe I can do ground. And then I did ground and I was like, holy shit. I actually took this picture and I made it without any pictures. This was done completely in substance. Just nodes and weird combinations of creating different things and getting the height maps right and the normal maps right. And then after all that was done, and after, all, after this was towards the end of my process, I was like, wow, I feel like I learned something and I made something, which is super rewarding. And that's why we have the Everyday Material Collection in our store right now. And if you get it now, I really don't mean this to be a commercial because this is really about my journey and learning, but ultimately, we gotta make a buck. Am I right? So it's a hundred and, help me out, Mike. $149 till Friday for 350 handcrafted materials. That's pretty crazy. So, should we try one? Should we make one? Should we make one right now, together? So, earlier today, I shot a photograph of the concrete floor at ABC here in your home area. I don't know what town you're from, so I'm just gonna say area. So what if we try to make that tileable and see what we can do? You guys, you guys down? All right, let's do it. And then uh, we'll, see where, where, we'll see where it goes. So I'm gonna, open up, I'm gonna open up Substance right now. I'm gonna try to position this so I can actually see. Let me know if you can hear okay. I'm just gonna rotate this a little bit. All right, so this is, I'm just gonna start with the actual photograph that I took of the concrete. All right, I'm just gonna double click that and this is substance. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not going to expect you guys to like, you know, learn it overnight. Yeah, they, they're excited about these concrete materials. Oh, sorry. Let me, uh, let me close that. That's probably because uh, me and PowerPoint, we're still learning how to get along. How's that? Better? All right, cool. Sorry. There you're like, what the hell is this guy doing? Uh, anyway, all right, so this is the concrete picture that I shot here in this area. <laughs> Yay. Uh, anyway, so we need to make this tileable. So what are we going to do? Well, the first thing I did here 
And the first thing I usually do is sort of assess the texture, and I'm like, okay, I cropped it to 4K. Let me look at what I got going on. Maybe it needs a little bit of sharpening. So if I come over here and I say uh, one to one, we can now look at this texture one to one. We're not zoomed in. We're looking at it one to one. So that looks pretty good. It's, it's got some good detail. It's got a lot of good little imperfections in here. And if I zoom all the way out like this and I hit the space bar, I can see how it's going to tile. It shows me how it's going to tile. And right now, it's not tiling for shit because it's, I haven't done anything yet. So I need to make it tile. So what do I do here? Well, you can see I dropped in this node called the Make It Tile Patch, which is the magic, magic node. What it does is it takes an input, a texture in my case, and it makes it tileable. Now, I'm going to drop a new one in here so we can see exactly what it's doing. I'm going to hit the space bar. I'm just going to say, make it rain. No, make it tile. And let's go ahead and drop that in. And we're going to pipe this right into the, oop, actually, I think it's a black and white map. So I'm going to have to do it to the make it tile patch grayscale. Let's dump that in there. All right, cool. So you can see it just made a bunch of like little soft circles. Not very exciting right now, but it does tile. So that's a good first step. So what do we need to do next? We need to figure out, okay, well, right now it's duplicating this, this concrete a lot. It's actually got way too many octaves. So I'm going to bring the octaves number down because I don't need that many. Let's say we, we're going to do like a four by four. That's probably pretty good. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to zoom in so that we can see how these different little patches are, are blending. And for my taste, like, it's way too perfect. So let's add some disorder. And let's add a little bit of size variation. And then I'm just going to mess around with the rotation variation. So right now, it's going to rotate each one of those patches in a, very, in a, in a varying way, uh, 347 degrees to be precise. And then we're going to just come in here and play with the mask precision and maybe a little bit more mask width, or pattern width, rather. And watch, see what it's doing? It's doing this intelligently. It's figuring out where the texture kind of meets and where it would blend well. And, and it's not just going to be a feathering. It's actually blending the texture. And if I bring up the, ma the, the mask warping, you're going to see more of that detail start to pop in around these edges, right? If I bring it all the way down, you can sort of see it goes away. I bring it up, it starts to come back, right? So in, I don't know how many seconds that was, not very many, I just created a tileable texture that works really, really well. And with a little bit of work, this could be great. And that's kind of what I did over here. So over here, you can see I tiled it twice just so I could get a variation. And that's the key to doing good materials and good textures is variation is absolute key because the real world has a lot of imperfections and a lot of things don't look perfect. So I tiled it once over here. I tiled it with a different seed over here. And then I blended them together just like you would in Photoshop or, or uh, After Effects. And I'm using like a cloud map. And then I clamp it a little bit. And I'm using that as a mask. And I'm just blending between these two nodes right here to get me a really nice looking texture. It's not quite where I like it yet. So you can see right here, I was like, oh, you know what? This is looking pretty good. But I want to create some dark spots on it. So over here, I've got a blend node. Then all I'm doing is adding a little bit of this. This is just a couple of different noises warping other noises. I'm not going to get too deep into that. But I discovered this look probably about midway through my journey. And I noticed that it was perfect for concrete because it creates sort of like that. Water is the great deteriorator. Water deteriorates everything. Everything in, in the world is, is eroded from water. It's 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 created from water. So water has a really interesting way of, of corroding concrete, and it usually creates patterns that are very similar to this. But not, obviously, you wouldn't use this one-to-one. -one. You want to mix that down. So you can see it's barely in there. And I'm going to show you before, and I'm going to show you after. And you're going to probably be like, I didn't see it. Well, you felt it. It's not that you saw it, it's that you felt it. And when you do textures, you want to have at least three levels of detail. You want to have big detail, medium detail, and little detail. Anything beyond that is cake, but three is minimum. So I try to remember that. I try to think, OK, this is going to help me with my big detail. It's going to help me look like the whole thing is one solid piece of concrete. All right, so then if I work my way down the tree a little bit, and I promise I'm trying to make nodes as exciting as I can. <laughs> But let's, let's, work this, let's work through this. I grab another noise, and I'm like, you know, I'm going to add a little bit of this and make it darker. I'm going to add a little bit of more dark spots right in this area. And you can see this is another great feature, too. So these dark spots right here are actually procedural. 
So these are, these are completely procedural, which means that if I don't like this one, I can go over to the random seed button and I can go, well, let's try a different one. Well, let's let that churn for a minute. That looks pretty cool. Let me see how that looks. Oh yeah, that actually is cool. And then you just start figuring out different ways of combining these things. And it's a lot like compositing. If you know compositing and you have a good grasp of compositing, then you can learn substance. It's very, very intuitive. Uh, and this, of course, is like me piping in a bunch of different color grades and whatnot to get my final output. And at the end of the day, what you're creating is a base material that you're going to throw onto your test object, which is right over here. So you can see I've paused my render, so I'm going to go ahead and resume this render. And we're going to go ahead and look at this sphere. So this is using iRay. And you can admit it's pretty good for Substance. I mean, it's totally awesome for doing look dev work. And if I want to look at a different HDRI, I can just come over here and drag that in there and look at a different HDRI. But I want to walk you through a little bit more of this texture before I uh, split off into another tangent. But when you start to create these materials right now, uh, I think it's probably best to show you with a new base. So let me grab a base. So you start with a base material, just like you would in any 3D program. You have a base material, and it's got diffuse. It's got reflection. It's got all the things that you're normally used to working. If I just drag this onto the sphere, it's just going to be like a shiny sphere right now. So I, I can come over to Substance and say, well, what kind of material is this? Well, um, uh, let's see. We have dielectric. We have gold. We have silver. We have aluminum. Well, in my case, um, it's a dielectric. And dielectric means that it does not conduct electricity. So concrete does not conduct electricity. It's a dielectric. It just means that it, it does not, it's not shiny, basically. So right now, I'm just going to empty this out. I'm going to come down to the bottom here. I'm going to say we're going to pipe in our own base color on this guy. And I'm going to take the base color of our concrete. I'm just going to double click it and make sure that we, we're tileable. Yep, see, look how much better that looks. And you can imagine like looking at it like this. That's probably going to look really good. And then if you get close in and you look at it one to one, that's going to look great. OK, cool. So let's put this into our our diffuse slot of the shader. And now we're going to see that show up on our, on our sphere. So then you can just start messing around and being like, OK, cool. Well, let's see. I probably want to add my own normal map. So you can see I turned on the normal map true. And it's, what's great about Substance is I can take a height map, or I can take any sort of map that I create. In my case, I just took the concrete, because I knew concrete was pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to get a good bump map out of it. It's, it's pretty easy to do that. I pipe this into a, a normal map node, and all of a sudden, all right, well, now it's taking that height information, and now I'm getting actual little crevices and, and little details and little pits in the concrete. And I mix that with a different node to even get bigger chunks. And this is something that uh, I probably won't have time to go over, but this is a technique that I started using when I started creating rocks of just warping different noises and creating these really interesting shapes that when you apply them to a normal map, if we look down here, you can see they start to look almost like rock. And if I combine them together with the actual image of the, of the concrete, you get something like this. Let me go and push this in here. So if you can see, there's, uh, it's actually really hard to see. I apologize. Let me make this bigger. I'm sitting here looking at my screen. All right, there we go. So now we've got actual interesting height information happening on this rock. And let's grab like maybe a, a slightly different shader. Or actually, you know what? That's probably good. But with that information, I can then put a, pull an ambient occlusion map out. And I can really start to go to the next level with it. And once you start to learn the fundamentals of this and understand it and build a shader, you can output it into any 3D application. Because at the end of the day, it's just spitting out texture maps. It's spitting out a diffuse map right here. Let's go ahead and make this nice and big. It's spitting out a normal map. It's spitting out a roughness map. In my case, I don't believe there's anything in this metallic map because we, we're not d using a metal surface. We don't have any AO, and right now we don't have any height. But it's all you need. You can just spit these maps out, plug them into a shader. No matter what renderer you're using, it's going to look great. Uh, but here's my favorite, absolute favorite, favorite part about using this workflow. And let me try to get my, I uh, lost my 3D view, but uh, that's fine. Let me see if I can get it back. And it's gone. That's fine. This is, this is what I wanted to show you. This is the most important thing. Random seed, right? You create it once. You create one material once. And I'm going to double click in the empty spot here. And when I double click in the empty spot in Substance, it's basically like telling Substance, all right, go back to the core of, of all of Substance and, and tell me what you want. And in my case, like let's say we made this material, this concrete, and we really like it, but we need five of them. 
We need five of these. And I only shot one here in Dallas. I only shot one texture. How are we possibly going to do that? Well, I can hit like this global random seed. And we're just going to wait. And it's going to generate a completely new concrete automatically. Boom, new concrete. I'll hit another one. It's going to think about it. It's chugging away. Boom, new concrete. Completely unique in every node has been randomized. So you imagine like being able to create one really good wood and then pull 10 from it, or create one really good brick and pull 20 from it. Like in production, that is huge. Huge. It's so huge. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little tipsy. Uh, anyway, so I guess at the, what I really wanted to convey here was that Number one, uh, I recommend learning a new tool, documenting your process. Uh, Substance is actually not hard to learn at all, and it's a lot of fun. And, uh, but really, at the end of the day, you're creating textures, and you need to put them somewhere. So I'm going to take a minute, and I'm going to show you something that we, I'm going to show you the 350 materials in action. This is an exclusive here tonight. I'm going to show you it in a, in a render engine that I think you might know. Um, so I've gotten approval uh, from the folks at Autodesk to show Arnold running on the GPU. So if anybody is excited about, hear about seeing that, um, we're just going to hope it works because uh, it is in beta still. And um, I am on a laptop. So there is that. But anyway, we're going to try it. We're going to see what happens. All right, I'm going to load up this scene. We're just going to let this cook for a sec. And it looks like a, a box, but you've got to trust me, there's, there's actual geometry in there. All right, so what, what am I talking about? What the hell is he talking about Arnold GPU? So you, how many people have heard of Arnold, the renderer? Like a lot of people, right? So it's been sort of in the works for a really long time. Arnold on GPU has been in the works. that has been shown at SIGGRAPH. Uh, and it has, I've been on the, I've been lucky enough be, to be on the beta for probably about four months now, five months, something like that. And it, it has come so far that I'm excited to show it. I wish I could show it on my home machine because this is obviously just like a 1060 laptop. It's not an awesome graphics card. But at home, I've got um, 2080 Ti's. And it's really optimized for the new RTX cards, the new NVIDIA RTX cards. It's super optimized for those. So I'm going to try to run it on this card, but I can't guarantee it's going to work. Now, what makes it great is that you can switch from CPU to GPU in one click. There's no, you don't have to reconfigure your materials. You don't have to completely redo your render settings. You do have to tweak some render settings. But for the most part, it's kind of one click. So I'm going to go ahead and just do like a regular render here first. And let's just do like some pretty uh, generic render settings, make it go pretty fast. And yeah, that's pretty good. Let me check my, my ray depth. All right. Yeah, that's fine. All right, let's kick off an IPR. All right, let's go ahead and do IPR. It's going to launch it. And I have a model here with, I believe, uh, one of the materials. Yeah, it's the. Um, uh, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Let me go back <laughs> and do CPU mode. All right, so this is the Arnold you're normally used to seeing. It's like a lot of refinement. It can be a little bit slow, and it's not. It, it's great. It's feature rich, extremely realistic looking, beautiful images on this render. It's one of my favorite renderers of all time. But it's CPU based, and if you don't have a really juicy CPU and you have GPUs, then you're kind of like, well, I guess maybe I can't use it. Well, this new version makes it so easy to switch from CPU to GPU. All you have to do is go over to the render device and choose GPU. That's it. You're done. You've now told it not to use the CPU, but to use the GPU. And I know that seems trivial. I know that seems like, well, that's not a big deal, right? Well, imagine writing a renderer twice. Imagine writing it for the CPU and getting it through production for 15 years on numerous feature films, working on tons of amazing projects, and then have to rewrite the whole thing on a different, on a different base, on, on a GPU. It was a huge undertaking. It's like writing it twice. But they've managed to make it look exactly identical. So if I go to the GPU and I hit play, 
It's going to take a second because it's I hit CPU and it's got to load it, but there it is. It's already refined. It's done. I mean, you can't even. It goes so fast it, you can barely see it happen. So let's go ahead and like just show you the interactivity of it. And that's got some depth of field in there. So let's go ahead and turn the depth of field off so we're not actually having to look through a blurry. But it is extremely quick. It's, re it's, re it's refined and done. And let me go ahead and just make this a little bit bigger. And I'm going to push the limits of this laptop. So if it dies, it's not my fault. All right, so let's look at some materials. We've been talking a lot about these materials. Let's actually show them. So I'm going to go to the EMC uh, Arnold, and we're going to pick some of those concretes that we were looking at. Let's grab the concrete. Maybe grab, uh, yeah, let's do this one. I'm just going to drag it right on there, and it's done. So when you're working with these materials and you're auditioning different looks, having a, a fast renderer is obviously great. But being able to sit here and be like, ah, you know, I don't really like that one. Let me try this one. Oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know what? I don't like concrete on this guy's face. I want, it's almost, it's near, we're close to the holidays, right? And so if I drag it over here and it just puts a line in, it means that you're just going to insert this into your scene. But if I'm going to replace it, I'm holding my mouse button down, by the way, and I just drag it till it makes a full box over the material and it replaces that material. Done. That's very handy. Very handy trick. Anyway, so let's go ahead and look at maybe a candy. No, that's not right. Let's try maybe a uh, leather. Let's do leather worn. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's get in there and look at the, let's see what that looks like closer up on his face. Let's get rid of that depth of field that's totally messing me up. All right, there we go. Perfect. And let's check out the uh, side angle. Yep, that looks great. So I wanted a material library that would be like that that I could just have off to the side and be like, leather, concrete, brick, perfect, done. And then that is what I made. And so I'm super stoked to share it with all of you. I'm also really stoked to show you Arnold GPU because it's actually super fun to play with. And uh, I have a few other videos um, of it running on my actual workstation that I want to show you before I answer questions and drink. Um, so here are a few screenshots that I took of it in action with other materials have, uh, on a more beefy GPU. So you can kind of see how quickly it's able to, uh, well, I feel like this is not playing back real time. Oh, there it goes. Uh, maybe the renderer in the background is messing it up. Let me try this. Let's go ahead and kill cinema and just show the videos. There we go. Ah, there we go. So you can see how quickly it converges. And this is on one GPU, one 2080 Ti. So once they get the uh, multiple GPUs working, I think this is going to, it's going to be octane fast or faster. Here's some other tests. My favorite test, though, Oh, by the way, it completely works with the jitter node, so you can get completely random textures working on instance geometry, which is a pain in, an, in most other renderers. And what, m orbiting lights around it is awesome, but this is my favorite part right here. The subsurface scattering in Arnold is the best in the business. It does subsurface scattering of the translucent effects that you see in skin and different phenomenon. It does it better than any other renderer, and it's now happening on the GPU. Obviously, this one takes a bit longer to clean up because it's doing a shit ton of math to get all the different levels of skin and translucency, but it's really impressive at this stage. Um, I, th I believe it's not, it doesn't work in that, dur in that way. Um, honestly, I, I, don't ha I don't know the science of it. But yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure on their site they have like a white paper or something on how they approach it. But orbiting lights and moving lights around is crazy interactive and fast. I would say it's on par with any other uh, renderer that I've been using. 
And of course, moving lights around uh, with complex geometry is also very intuitive and quick. And this is a very dense model, by the way. And this is using the new R20 uh, multi-instances. So it's using multi-instances. We've got lights. We've got GI. We've got uh, a complex material with uh, 4K textures. It's not a trivial scene by any means. Uh, and here's some more translucent skin renders that I was doing at a, captured at a higher frame rate. But yeah, this is, not, this is actually really freaking hard for a renderer to do, which is really good subsurface happening real time on the GPU. And I'm sort of a I'm sort of a stickler for that. I don't really I don't really consider what what Octane and Redshift do in subsurface to be truly realistic subsurface. So for me this was like awesome to play with this and, and just have fun with this weird head scan <laughs> that was creeping out my kids. But anyway, um, I feel like I've been talking way too long. Let's do some questions. And uh, I'll, you know what, I'll just leave that going because that's kind of fun to watch. Are you guys still awake? Yeah, Wake up! Oh, I got you another one. Oh, dude, <laughs> what are you doing to me? <laughs> All right. All right, does anyone have any questions for Chad? I know there's lots. That's some TX whiskey right there because you're in Texas that's good. right there. Sorry? What's the craziest texture that you took on your journey? Well, I have one that uh, I have one that I did I made that I didn't take a picture of, but I don't know why I did it, but I made bubble wrap oh. just to see if I could do it, and I did, and it was fun. And so I don't know what person would want bubble wrap. Did they actually displaced? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, um, oh shoot, you know what? Um, actually, yeah, if you. Uh, I don't have it, and I'm not on the internet, but yeah, it's awesome. Just take my <laughs> word. <laughs> Just imagine it, bubble wrap. Anybody else? Over here? So many. Oh, you, you do it. So how do you decide when you're creating your um, bulk maps versus normal maps and your height maps? Like, are you intending to use all of them, or just go with normal? That's a great question. Um, I, I almost always am going with normal. And I see how far I can push it before I have to go displacement. So for instance, um, the brick textures, like the brick, uh, the brick textures that I made were probably, I'd say 50% normal, and then 50% I had to go to displacement to get that extra level of detail. So usually what I would do is like push it as far as I could and then move the camera in and say, oh, you know what, I can tell it's not, it's not actually displacing the geo, so I'm gonna go back in and do a displacement map. So it was kind of like I wanted to approach it really sort of from like a, a, an economical standpoint, like only generating maps that I actually needed because I didn't want to bloat the pack with a bunch of maps that you don't need. Is there, is there a advantage like using, it's all right, I, everyone can hear me. Um, it's for the internet. Oh, no, they can hear me too. <laughs> Um, okay, so as far as like bump maps and normal maps, is there any advantage to using both, or is just one or the other okay? Because I know in Redshift specifically, like if you're using both, you have to merge them all together and then throw them into a bump. Oh yeah. So the question is, when to use a normal map and when to use a bump map, or like yeah, should I mean, you use is them there in combination? Is it advantageous to use both of them, or is it even going to make a difference? Normally, normally. Get that? You see what I did there? Um, no, I would probably use a normal map for most things. And uh, I tend to never use like height maps as bump maps. Uh, I tend to stick with the normal maps just because it's, you can push it a lot further. If you want to like, I've learned in Substance actually, like you can push a normal map a lot further than you could like a grayscale bump map. Like you can blow it way out and it'll look pretty good for a while. Whereas like a, a height-based normal map or height-based bump map is going to break pretty quickly. There might be, I think some engines will only allow you to choose normal or bump, Yeah. right? Is that way. You can combine them. You can combine normals, but you know, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever tried to do like a height bump and a normal bump, mm -hmm. but yeah. All right. No. Arnold does not. 
No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just NVIDIA then? Yes, this is not running like on Octane. In, it, it's running on NVIDIA cards only, and it is, uh, uh, it's optimized for the RTX line, which is the 2080 Ti's, and I think there's an, another one below that. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the more expensive ones, I believe, they're called the, uh, what are they called? The Help Voltas? Me no, 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 the, the, uh, the Quadro cards. Like, quadro, you, okay. like if you want to do yeah, the Quadro yeah. cards. But yeah, it's, um, so I have two 2080 Ti's, and so the reason I'm only rendering on one of them is they're still working on multi-GPU support. So they haven't cracked that yet. They haven't figured out how to way to get multiple GPUs going. So if you imagine this on four, like four times the speed, that's what I hope it will be. Can you Abs animate? Can textures? you animate textures in substance, or just like wherever? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> I like this guy's style. Uh, in substance, no, but you can for sure in any like 3D application, you could, you know, move them, you could scale them, you could blur them, you could affect them in different ways. Uh, an animated texture out of substance would be pretty interesting though, uh, because it, it would sort of allow you to like animate some of those noises. Maybe someday they'll add that. That's kind of neat. That's yeah, a good idea. that's a cool idea. We're going to develop that. You got, got two. You pick. You got another one? All right. Uh, so whenever you pitched the idea to even build this pack, like, was it just like they, people were saying, like, you're crazy? Or like, <laughs> you know, the team said? Or uh, well, you know, I, I don't think, it, it's funny, like, when I, when I started it, I did not think it was going to be 350. Like, I thought, oh, it'll be 50, you know? And then I started to learn more, and I learned more. And the more I learned, the more I made. And then it just started growing and growing and growing. And then, of course, like we had to develop other plugins. We put out like Lightkit Pro 3. We put out Gorilla Cam. So I put it away for a long time. Like I would work on it, and then I'd put it away, and then I'd bring it back and work on it a little bit more. And then we knew we wanted to get it out before the end of the year. So then it was a final push at the end of the year here, where uh, I had to like hire people to help me convert them to the different renderers. And Mike was working on the website, and I was working on the on the pack. And it was like a huge effort to get it out. But yeah, it 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 didn't. It didn't start off to be this massive, but it just sort of became it. And I'm totally fine with it because it, every single one of them I feel is useful. So I'm really proud of it. The entire pro so the pictures of me going on that safari for shooting textures was a year ago uh, last month. And I would say that if I had to cram all of it into one like single timeline, it was probably about five months of learning because I had to learn that entire program and create. So it was like, and doing all my regular GSG stuff. So it's like, it was all kind of compounded. But if I crammed it all, I'd say four months probably. And honestly, like when you're learning a program like that, um, and I already had node experience. I had done node-based compositing and node-based materials. So for me, it was, it was a pretty quick learn. But I think that to get really proficient in any program, you have to spend like a year on it at least to get to a point where you can bring up a reference image and hit it every time. That takes a lot of time. And you have to just put in the hours. And the thing about Substance too is that if you learn that, it works with so many other programs. It's a really great program to learn. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a... It can feed uh, on, uh, game engines and Maya right. and cinema. It can feed all kinds of stuff. Right. So if you're a game developer, if you're doing Cinema 4D, if you're doing Houdini, yep. whatever it is. So. so when you've got all your reference photos and you're deciding to make a texture based on this reference, what factors go into your decision as to whether this is going to be a photo-based texture or a completely procedural texture? That is a great question. Um, you might have to repeat that for the... Okay, so the question words. was, and I hope I get this right, uh, how do I decide what's going to be procedural and what's going to be photo-based, right? So it really was sort of a... Um, it, it was more of an intuitive sort of gut check process. Like if I, if I started with concrete, let's say, I knew I shot a ton of concrete, and I, I thought, you know, I, I got that handled. I can do concrete with photo base and then augment it with procedural stuff. But things like brick are actually really hard. I do have some photo base bricks in, in the pack. But what I learned was 
it's really hard to find a brick wall or any sort of like sur wood is a perfect example. If you wanted to find a good piece of wood, like that wall back there, let's say, you might be able to find eight inches of it that were clear, right? And like that's not going to work because you need to be at like a two foot or a ten foot distance from that wood. And I can't get that piece of wood any bigger than like a foot by a foot. So I knew if I was if I couldn't shoot it due to scale restrictions that I was going to have to make it procedurally. So all of the wood textures are procedural because of that. It's really hard to source wood at that size because it just you don't trees don't grow in ten foot radiuses. So it's like that was like, okay. I'll do that. And then there would be some things that I thought I would do with my photos and then realize that it would be easier to do it procedurally. So it was more of like a, there wasn't a rule. It was more of like, okay, a gut check. Like, okay, this one would work, this one wouldn't work. And I would try it and it might break and I'd have to go back. But I sort of limited myself to that photo shoot and like didn't shoot much beyond that so that I would force myself to learn this tool. Does that make sense? Anybody else? So what's the percentage of procedural versus photo based? I would say that it's I would say it's probably 50 to 60% photo based and 40 to 50% procedural. Cool. But yeah, the leather the leather's unique because I had the leather texture and then I just figured out some really fun ways to manipulate it to look exactly how I wanted it through procedural. So a lot of them are a mix. They're like half procedural, they're like hybrids. Anybody else? The custom preview object that you made to preview your texture, mm -hmm. can you translate that into cinema? Like, can you bring, did you do that for any of the Funny you asked. I did make a, a custom material preview ball for the material pack that you can download as part of the download for. Uh, f and it uses that shader ball, but just the top part of the shader ball. But yeah, it is in there, and you can use it for uh, you can use it for Redshift and Arnold. Unfortunately, Octane doesn't support a custom material ball, so you won't be able to use it in Octane. Anyone? Is that it? This guy's got a question. Oh, oh, sure. Snap. Let me take a drink. Uh, let me think of a good one. Um, all right. I'm just going to... You guys want movie trivia? Is that cool? Stick with the movie theme? Yeah? All right. <laughs> Damn it! Uh, let's see. Um, hmm. All right. Uh, let me think about... Oh, here's a good one. Eric Bana, who is in Hannah, the movie that I referenced that texture from, was in another uh, movie where he played a very angry green man. All right, you just won 350 materials. It's just fun saying that. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you, DFW, for bringing me out. MoGraph.com, an online resource for motion graphic artists. Start your week with the MoGraph podcast. Industry news, interviews with your favorite artists, and terrible humor. Watch live shows and interviews from MoGraph events like NAB, Seagraph, Half Res, and local meetups. <laughs> Our MoGraph talks feature live demos and motivation from artists all around the world. Sometimes you gotta make stuff that you're not gonna put on your reel, and I'm not here to judge. What if Rick and Morty show up for the countdown at midnight? That's where I peaked in life, in my career. We gotta stop this thing, Rick! It's gonna kill us all! Hear from the people that create your software, design your render engines, and artists that are changing the face of modern motion graphics. You get that render done. Yeah, you better frame, frame what?
MoGraph tutorials and online classes will teach you about Cinema 4D, After Effects, as well as other popular software and render engines. Throw in the HDR Studio, take the render settings, pick the HDR, put a reflection, and gorgeous! Branch into new software, learn time-saving tips, techniques, workflows, and lessons that'll keep you up to date in the world of motion design. Oh, brother! Those are some of my favorite elves! I love projects that scare me. When our art director comes to us and asks for something that I had never done before, man, it gets me pumped. Join the conversation in our live sessions, check out our plugins, or join the hundreds of daily active users in our Slack channel for technical help, advice, contests, or just to joke around. Real nice banana. Ah, that's so funny! All right! I'm gonna live forever! <laughs> Subscribe today and get the latest updates on our YouTube and other social media channels. Take all your dreams and just do it! We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Subscribe to MoGraph.com.